Great secret agent recently returned to the field uh, has just been reassigned to. He's got a he's got a new secret mission, which is to prevent electoral fraud. Topical, <laughs> 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 so topical. <laughs> we got We're lucky. <laughs> Everyone was like, this book sounds like a fun romp. We sold this two years yeah, ago. We yeah, didn't yeah. And it was like, oh, what a fun espionage romp. And then it was like, this book is the voice of our time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Cyril DePaul, disgraced secret agent, recently returned to the field, has just been assigned to prevent electoral fraud in the western province of Geta, a nation state called Nusklin. And he's not super thrilled about it. <laughs> Uh, he had a very bad experience in the field several years ago and was sort of emergency removed, uh, was gravely injured and has been sort of suffering from PTSD and in physical convalescence from emergency surgery for a while. Um, he is also, I don't know if anyone has, has read any of the press releases and or blogs, the million blogs that I have written in the last <laughs> month. Uh, he's he's conducting an ill-advised affair with a black market kingpin, while like his desk job is to, to bring down smugglers. And he's like, oh, you know what would be fun while doing this is to have an affair with the king of the smugglers in the city in which I am working. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. So so in this scene, he is having dinner with said smuggler and has just been given this assignment that he doesn't really. When Aristide came down the stairs into the long, low dining room of the Crabtree house, he saw Cyril waiting at the bar. Unaware of Aristide's scrutiny, Cyril curled one hand around his signature rye and soda and made the other a fisted column for the bowed weight of his head. His crisp navy suit and the high shine of his brogues might have fooled a casual observer, but Aristide knew the curve of those shoulders intimately, and all the pride had been beaten from them. He didn't brighten up over dinner. By the time the server took away the cheese plate, Aristide had had enough. You're awfully quiet, he said, stirring a lump of muscovado into his coffee. <laughs> when Aristide had last seen Cyril five days ago, he'd been hungover and peevish, gray with fatigue. Now, the flickering candle on the tabletop cast warm light onto the planes of his face, disguising the dark shadows under his eyes. He had shaved, no, been shaved, and the clean line of his newly starched collar made a bright stripe against his smooth skin. Am I? Despite his fresh appearance, lingering exhaustion colored his speech and movements. He stared into a cordial glass, turning it on its base so the liqueur hung in veils on the crystal. Sorry. Hard day at the office, dear. Aristide flirted over the rim of his cup, waiting for Cyril's repost. It didn't come. Instead, Cyril snorted and sipped his digestif. The susurrus of other tables' conversation, the quiet nip of silver against China, rose into the silence as their repartee faltered. Aristide sighed loudly enough that Cyril looked up from his drink with weary eyes. Go on, Cyril said. I know you want to ask. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Aristide set his spoon down harder than he meant to, spattering the tablecloth with coffee. You haven't said four words together all evening, and you look like a whipped spaniel. <laughs> <laughs> Cyril covered the coffee stains with his fingertips. I have to leave Amberlo. Trouble with the lower element, asked Aristide, only half joking. Who did you murder? I can probably smooth it out. <laughs> no, it, it's just work, but thank you for the offer. He was silent for a moment, then added, I'll be gone a while, a, a month or two. So, Central's finally realized you're wasted on the demimonde. Aristide slid his palm across the linen and took up Cyril's resting hand. Where are they sending you that you required such a sublime manicure? <laughs> Cyril's nails shone, freshly buffed, filed to white tipped crescents. I hear that field work can be quite strenuous. Won't you only ruin it? He didn't have a clear picture of Cyril's career, but his skin was marred all over with a memory of violence. Without thinking, Aristide tightened his grip. Not this time, Cyril said, extricating himself. At least, I hope not. 
are they sending you to fool foreign nobility, as Aaron's did, or impersonate a concert pianist, perhaps? Cyril flexed his hands, self-consciously curling them into fists to hide his fingernails. No, he said with crisp finality. Aristide ignored Cyril's irritation and kept up the banter. True, I don't suppose you know how to play, but you could always learn. You're clever. Culpepper wouldn't put up with you otherwise. And let's be honest, neither would I. <laughs> Harry, so what is it? Or were you just suddenly struck by the shameful state of your cuticles? Here his diction turned sharp, accusatory, and thought you'd have a shave and a haircut at Patterson Sons while somebody buffed your nails. Cyril's face went slack and surprised, and he looked ten years older. Give me some credit, purred Aristide, low and smooth with malice. <clears throat> Not that you don't keep in a fine trim on your own, but even a common boot black would notice the difference. And anyway, the scent of the pomade is unmistakable. You reek of sage and ambergris. <laughs> this last comment he kept light, tossed onto the table like a thoughtless tip. It earned him a scowl. Maybe I just decided to treat myself. Cyril, please. From one professional liar to another, don't work tired. Your technique suffers. <laughs> he finished his coffee. He'd been hoping for the gratification of Cyril's trust, but settled for his shock instead. Now, why don't we retire somewhere more private and you can tell me all about Newsland? Because of course it was Newsland. Aristide paid enough attention to politics to know what was at stake there. Cyril's expression settled between fury and affection. Why do I consistently underestimate you? Aristide pushed his chair away from the table and stood. A pretty face will do that. You of all the people should never. <laughs> yeah, so. That <laughs> <laughs> things, things go wrong. <laughs> things go very wrong. Uh, and he ends up sort of abandoning the mission that he was assigned to do and becoming a collaborator with sort of a nascent fascist movement that's attempting to take over the country. <laughs> oh, it was that all? Sounds <laughs> refreshing. It was fun two years ago. It was fun. <laughs> It was fun two years ago. Now it's like now it's a bit of a how-to, but it was fun. Use <laughs> well, your time machine for good. <laughs> Sorry, guys. There is, there, is, there is a sci-fi element to this. Yeah. Yes. Um. Anyway, so so the election happens. It doesn't happen quite the way everyone hoped it would. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> where Aristide also works as the MC. Uh, she was recently caught in flagrante delicto with the stand-up comedian Tori McIntyre uh, by her boss and boyfriend, Malcolm. <laughs> uh, so the morning after the election, though, that is like the last thing on her mind. Right? We all had problems. And then we woke up and we were like, my problems are like inconsequential. <laughs> all right, so Cordelia wakes up post-election. Cordelia woke up late on the morning after the election. Actually, one second, Diana, will you hand me my water bottle? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Just in time for the train. <laughs> trying to send this one picture. It looks like I'm bored, but I swear. It's like, it's just the reception. I'm standing in the front just like, like I don't oh, even care. God, who cares? No, <laughs> it's just like, can't get a signal. Anyway. Get a photo, it's whatever. Like, morning I'm after the election. Cordelia woke up late on the morning after the election with a roaring headache. Her hair was tangled in a glittering paste tiara. Face paint stained her pillow, regionalist, golden blue. Amberlinians couldn't vote in the Western elections, but that didn't mean they couldn't celebrate. A nakedly sewn boy sprawled upside down in the bed, one foot propped on the headboard. His broad chest rose and fell with whistling snores. Cordelia stretched and rubbed the crusted makeup from her eyes, then reached for her alarm clock, which she had not set the night before. Ah, Queen's cunt! 
She kicked free of the <laughs> snarled sheets and hit the cold floor. Get up, you! She grabbed a handful of the boy's woolly dreadlocks and shook his head. I need to get to work. Still torched from whatever he'd been taking the night before, he only smiled and reached out for her. She sneered and shook free. Ten minutes before I throw you out, close a nun. He staggered into his trousers, gathered everything else, and made a hasty exit. The taps downstairs ran icy cold, so Cordelia washed up fast. Shivering but clean, she sprinted back upstairs to throw on culottes and one of Malcolm's old sweaters she still had lying around. She had to make the next trolley if she didn't want hiding from him. He'd stayed surly with her after the Tory scrap, and while they had a few good nights, on the whole, he was thornier with her than anyone else at the club. But she didn't worry about it long. By the time she got on the trolley, she'd seen the papers. Surprise, Ackerby victory sweeps Newsland. Ackerby takes western seat. It was all any of the passengers were talking about. She turned to the man next to her, who had a copy of the clarion spread across his knees. What's it say, she asked. It can't be true, can it? Everybody said Reliance was a shoe in She should have been. His impressive white mustache is gross and fell to be signed. There's more than a few crying false. Allegations of fraud is what the paper folks are saying. And no wonder. Cordelia didn't hold back her reedy wine. Not, no need to f play fine and fancy at this end of station way. Ain't no Mooski with half a bit of sense would cast a ballot for that dredged up dog prick. And we all know it, don't we? He folded up his paper. This'll get sorted out fast. See if it don't. As the trolley drew to a stop, he handed the paper to her. Here, he said, I'm through with it. Got enough troubles hanging on my tie. At the theater, most everybody was gathered in the house. Seated around the mosaic tables, the cast and crew smoked and talked and passed the afternoon papers between them. Dilly! Tori stood on his chair and waved for her to come over. She went, reluctantly. She tried to avoid him in the last month just to keep out of the pot with Malcolm. But the tight cliques and couples of the theater were unraveling right now. Hearsay flew between the tables about Ackerby and Newsland. The air was electric with nervous laughter and cocky assurances that Staler would put the old Ospies in the corner quick enough. How's it turning, she asked, sliding into the seat. How's it look like? Tori stubbed out the butt of a twist and let his hands rest on the table for a moment. Then, unable to stop fidgeting, he got out his tobacco and rolling papers and made up another one. Plague and pestilation, but what must have happened to New Squin last night? They counted their cards, she said. Paper folk were all saying it. No matter if the fat fish were back in the Ospies, everybody knew that Reed Lyons was going to win the seat. You seem fair confident. Not worried about the Ospies taking over and shutting down all Amarillo's tit shows? <laughs> he licked the edge of his rolling paper and twisted it into a neat tube, pinched at each end. Yeah, I suppose you've always been a day-to-day -day type. She didn't think he meant it as an insult. Not to worry. It's better than sitting on my ass, smoking all my shag. She flicked the end of his freshly rolled cigarette. It's a heavyweight kind of battle. Nothing any of us welches can do about it. No. Not unless you're packing a snubby and planning to cozy up to Ackerby some night soon. I can poke a hole in a man with a ogun belly. Oh yeah, I forgot. The firepower of a good joke, she rolled her eyes, <laughs> killing him with comedy. <laughs> and why not? He struck a match and lifted it to his face. The firelight shadowed the frown lines in his forehead. They ran deep for such a funny man. I've known a good odd laugh to bring on apoplexy. <laughs> Cordelia was going to tell him she'd known a couple other things to bring on the too. But Malcolm came barreling onto the stage with a fistful of wrinkled sheet music and the morning stubble darkening his jaw. Am I paying you all to sit around and bark at one another? His voice carried across the space, turning heads. I didn't think so. That projection was wasted off the stage. Then again, Cordelia couldn't think what kind of act would fit him. Maybe strongman. Or a lion tamer? Curtain goes up same time tonight as every night. He strafed his employees with narrow black eyes like machine gun barrels. People cringed, but he held his fire till he struck on Tori and Cordelia. You better be on your toes, he said. Though he meant it for the company, Cordelia knew it was aimed at her. I ain't above sacking anybody who lets this election get in the way of their performance. Well. It would have been a solid threat, but it didn't hold up long. 
The double doors at the back of the house swung open like a set piece, revealing Aristide Macker Costa like the climax of a campy drama. <laughs> the entrance was perfectly timed. Cordelia didn't think he was above listening at the keyhole for the right cue. <laughs> <laughs> Awfully sorry I'm late, he rolled, stripping off a pair of claret kid gloves. With theatrical surprise, he took note of them all gathered in front of the stage, half in street clothes still. My, my, what is happening here? Haven't we got a show to put on? Malcolm turned a dangerous shade of red, not too different from Ari's gloves. Macrocosta. He leveled his crumpled sheet music like a baton and thrust it at the target of his rage. What kept you? Aristide's smile was thin and sharp as the blade of a Market Street fish knife, and he broke out the Central City stutter. Apologies, Malcolm. It was a, a trifling matter, and obviously it could have waited. I didn't realize what a state the p place would be in when I arrived. <laughs> Malcolm let his fistful of music fall to his side. You and me both. It's neither, said Aristide, and flats off the shade. <laughs> his departure seemed to signal to the rest of the cast who rose from their chairs. Cordelia followed in the general rush, hoping to avoid a scene. For once, she was grateful to that overgrown, overrated, blushed boy. He'd drawn enough of Malcolm's ire that she might make it out unnoticed. But just before she gained the downstage entrance, Malcolm grabbed her by the arm. The overlarge sweater made him miss her flesh, and he ended up with a handful of knitted wool. Still, it was enough to yank her from her path. He scanned her face without reading her eyes. You don't even have your paint on yet. Trolley was running late, she said, thrusting her chin in the air. Swine shit, she huffed. Look, Mal, the whole city's hung right over, still asleep, or they got the noses in their rears over the headlines out of New Zealand. She grabbed her sleeve and tugged it from his grip. What do you want from us? We ain't no different from the rest of them. Oh, you are, he said, and you're a damn sight worse. Then he did a double take, half reaching toward her arm again. His face went soft, then crumbled back into a frown. Delia, what are you wearing? You look like a rag lady. She gathered the folds of his oversized sweater more tightly around herself and marched for the stage door. Over her shoulder, she offered, well, at least I don't look like an asshole. <laughs> to imagine where all these theatrical characters came from. So, <laughs> so I guess I'll take questions if anyone has them. Oh, Watsi was like right on that. Yeah? Yeah, where's the audio book? Where's the audio book? <laughs> <laughs> so I had a very fun phone conversation with Mary Robinette Kowal, who's an amazing author as well as a puppeteer and voice actor uh, about pronunciations of names, places, and various words in the manuscript because she recorded the audio book this week. Blanche, who has an incredibly affected stutter, <laughs> uh, which I poached and, and put into the book. <laughs> <Very much wholesale. laughs> so yes, <laughs> Leia, yeah? Is there going to be a sequel? <gasps> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> There's not a contract. <laughs> that's Everyone buy a copy. <laughs> yes, buy the book, please. Buy the book. That's, buy the book. that's 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 the sequel book. <laughs> We've got one, buy the book. <laughs> Anybody else? Huzzah. Huzzah! Woo! There's free wine! Drink the free wine! Yeah. I think I think they're gonna be signing books. I, I will yeah. sign books. Why else would you be here? Yeah, why else would I be here? Definitely after the reading. One more Keep time. Going. <laughs> One more time. Free birds. One more time. <laughs>
It would have gotten to the Secretary of Education next. This one weaving to the back of the room. Boom. Yes. Where did this come from? Where does this come yeah. from? Yeah. How did this come about? Oh, where did this come from? So I first watched the movie Cabaret in 2008. Uh, incidentally, on my laptop in the car driving to the Alpha Young Writers Workshop, which if you know a science fiction or fantasy writer between the ages of 14 and 19, I highly recommend the program. It's super incredible. It got me basically where I am today. Tell all your little teeny bopper friends. Uh, I'm also, I'm staff there. I, I staff every summer, so I will be teaching them. I will be corrupting them and <laughs> uh, destroying them for anything else except a life in sin and science fiction writing. Uh, so I watched the movie in 2008 and was like, this movie is incredible. And then it just kind of stewed for a really long time. And then in 2010, uh, I took a road trip around the coast of Ireland with my dad. And we drove through, on accident, I think, like totally on accident, we took a wrong turn and we drove through the Shifri Pass, which is like the northernmost part of the Republic of Ireland. It's incredibly sparsely populated. It's really poor. It's mostly like, like scraggly sheep farmers, but it's gorgeous. It's like one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. And while I was there, I got this idea for a scene and was like, I don't know who these people are. I don't know how they got here. But they're like, like one of them is waiting for another and something horrible happened and he had to flee from wherever he was and I don't know why. So I had this scene, <laughs> Zelma who has read the book is slowly dying. <laughs> I, had, scene. I had this scene in my head and this scene has been in every iteration of the story from the very oh first short God. story that I wrote uh, all the way through the published novel. And I, like the people who were in it like changed every time. Aristide has always been in it, but like the other people who were in it kept revolving. <laughs> um, but it's like I, I sort of connected my and I had also I read a lot of Isherwood's short stories and, and uh, sort of the iterations of Isherwood's short stories that led to Cabaret. Like, it, it became this bizarre like he wrote uh, two novels, which became a stage play, which became a musical, which became a movie, which then was revived on Broadway, and then it like turned into a memoir that he wrote, revisiting that, and then it was revived on Broadway again. And like every version of it is different, and I've seen almost all of them. <laughs> uh, and that somehow in my brain got connected to this like person waiting in this desolate rural setting. And then the only thing that was left to, was to connect, like, how do we get from 1930s Berlin to, like, desolate rural Ireland? <laughs> and that's how I wrote the novel! <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. Anybody else? Totally. Back there? Way back there in the crowd, anyone? No? Oh, yes? Are you in the novel? Am I in the novel? I, I actually realized, like, recently as I was going through rereading, I did an illustrated, um, advanced reader's copy to give away in the contest, which meant that I was like going back through the book and reading it to come up with illustrations. And as I was reading it, I was like, oh, all three of these main characters are actually like different versions of me, <laughs> like in different situations, which is actually pretty unflattering. <laughs> like, oh my God, there is a terrible person. Because uh, they are all pretty objectionable people, except Cordelia, who's great. <laughs> Powers because we're sort of into the same like 
anal historical accuracy, <laughs> like, mixed with outlandish magical occurrences or, like, crazy fantasy. Um, so I, I really do like writing in historical settings with sort of an infusion of fantasy. Um, whether I have anything out that is similar to that, I'm blanking on. Sam and I are working on something that's set in World War One slash the 30s slash 1967. <laughs> so it's like... It's complicated. It's three different historical eras with science fiction. Yeah. So I do, I'm really into, I'm really into old stuff. <laughs> All right, it's your we... last Ooh, chance. It's your last chance. I'm going away after this, and I won't answer any more. Never questions. again. <laughs> Never talk. All right, if there are no more questions, oh, there's a question. Hi, I'm actually Lara's publicist. Yeah, and, full disclosure. Um, I have a favor to ask of everybody who came wearing an amazing outfit, and I see a lot of you. Um, I would like you to, um, after Lara's done with her question, to go up to the front, and I want to take a picture of you. I'm All you vintage you folks, stuff. you know who you are. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what vintage? Yeah. Last year. <laughs> this is your immortality. My immortality. Still insulting. Anyway, so go up to the front and I'll take a picture of everyone standing in front of